freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's Tonight. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration. A TV exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick, where he also discusses sexual assaults taking place in migrant hotels. Did see uh, some very concerning incidents, for example, at the asylum hotels, uh, individuals committing sexual assault. That's not to be missed. Also... Find out why Queers for Palestine want us to boycott Eurovision. <laughs> Is it ever OK for parents to smack their kids to teach them discipline? Three, two, one... Is Ramadan now more popular than Easter? On my panel tonight, it is Apprentice finalist Joanna Jarju. I've got commentator Alex Armstrong and ex-ITV political chief John Sargent. Oh, and I'll show you what led up to this. Oh, uh, no! Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Nigel Farage has asked me to relay a message to Rishi Sunak. Next. Patrick, thank you very much and good evening from the GB Newsroom. It's just gone nine o'clock and uh, I want to start with some news that we're getting out of Wimbledon in South London tonight, where a journalist working for the Iran International Network is recovering after being stabbed outside of his London home. We understand that attack took place at some point this afternoon. Police and paramedics responded to the scene and the victim, believed to be in his 30s, is now in a stable condition. Police, though, aren't sure at this stage, they say, what motivated that attack. However, because of the victim's role as a journalist at the Iranian network based here in the UK, we understand that incident is being investigated by specialist counter-terrorism officers, though no arrests have been made so far. In other news, the new leader of the Democratic Unionist Party has described the charges of serious historical sex offences against Sir Geoffrey Donaldson as, he says, devastating. Donaldson quit as leader earlier and has been suspended from the DUP pending the outcome of the legal process. Comes just after last month, he brought back the group into power sharing. Gavin Robinson has been appointed as the interim leader after being made aware of the allegations late last night. Things caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland, it came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so in the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice <clears throat> what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. Rishi Sunak is tonight facing criticism for awarding a major Conservative donor a knighthood as part of a controversial honours list. Sir Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and was knighted for what's described as services to business, to charity and politics. Labour, though, have condemned the award as they say an arrogant act of an entitled man, adding that donations shouldn't be an automatic pass to honours. Police are appealing for help in their search for a man suspected of raping two women in London. The attacks took place four years apart, first in Westminster in 2018, followed by another incident in Shoreditch in 2022. 
Those offences were being investigated as separate crimes. The forensic work has helped to draw a link between them. Detectives say it's highly likely the suspect has also committed other attacks. The Metropolitan Force has released this eFit image here. You can see if you're watching on television. And they're asking anyone who may have information to contact police or to call Crime Stoppers. And finally, before we head back to Patrick, the UK's Eurovision entry, Ollie Alexander, has rejected calls to withdraw from the song contest, issuing a joint statement signed by eight other contestants. More than 450 artists and organisations are among a group calling itself Queers for Palestine. They signed an open letter demanding the Years and Years singer to pull out of the competition in protest over the inclusion of Israel. But in response, Oli Alexander said that while he supports a full ceasefire in Gaza, boycotting the contest, he says, would not help achieve that goal. That collective reply was signed by artists representing eight participating countries, including Northern Ireland, Norway, Portugal and Finland. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in the next hour. You can, in the meantime, sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Patrick. Good evening. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak hasn't just given up. He's already moved on. Here is Tory MP Danny Kruger being caught on tape saying what everybody's thinking. I think that the obstacle of conservatism is the Conservative Party. And I cannot get there, what they're saying. They're there through destructive force. I think it would be a tragedy if they did end up replacing us. But their general critique of what's wrong, I think, is mostly valid. Yes, obviously, a little bit muffled that, but he raises the issue that he thinks that reform could replace the Tories and also says that they are bang on the money when it comes to the key issues. Well, the Reform Party is now beating the Tories with working class voters in the north and it's level with them in the Midlands as well. And they're neck and neck, apparently, with the 50 to 64-year-old age bracket. Well, Rishi Sunak appears to be making no attempt to win them back. He could have done something about legal immigration. But now it turns out that he never actually cared about it. Here is what former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick told me directly. Try to talk about legal immigration and, and it was just batted away. Yes. You know, both Suella uh, and I wrote on a number of occasions, often together, uh, sometimes on our own. I wrote privately to the Prime Minister, setting out the case for reducing legal migration, and uh, we didn't routinely get responses. So the former immigration minister there saying that the Prime Minister didn't want to discuss immigration. A Conservative Prime Minister who doesn't care about rapid demographic change or preserving British culture? Remarkable. Both Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer are currently up for grabs. Rayner over the old tax issue, Starmer over the Gaza ceasefire vote. If he pushed, there is a chance that Rishi could get rid of them both. But Sunak is refusing to do anything about that. Why not? Well, he obviously isn't up for the fight. He has decided that he wants to be the man who banned smoking and introduced more A-levels. Is that a bloke? who wants to win an election or just look good on the dinner party circuit. Any Conservative politicians holding out hope that Rishi might develop an urge to buy Nigel Farage off and stop him from wiping the toys off the map by giving him a cushy job as our envoy to America. That was doing the headlines earlier on, by the way. That was the rumour today. Well, unfortunately, I've got some bad news for you. I called Nigel at about 4pm today and I asked him whether or not there was any chance of this happening. Now, here is a direct quote for you. I am not for sale. If they wanted to do this, they should have done it in 2017. Rishi is finished. The fact that they are thinking of doing this now shows what dreadful people they are. I don't think he's taking the job. Do you? And today, Mr Sunak handed honours to several AI and tech people, as well as apparently the Netflix CEO. Well, what does that tell you? So let's stick to the plan that if we stick to the plan, we can deliver a brighter future for everyone. We stick to our plan, and if we stick to the plan, we can make sure that everyone has peace of mind, that there's a brighter future for them and their family. But if we stick to the plan, I know that we'll absolutely get there and deliver a brighter future for everyone in our country. Yes, it tells you that he has got a plan, and his plan is to go back to California ASAP. But let's get the thoughts of my panel tonight. It is apprentice finalist and entrepreneur, Joanna Jarju. I've got political commentator Alex Armstrong, an ex-ITV and BBC political chief, 
John Sargent. John, I'll start with you on this. Rishi Sunak, I think he's checked out, hasn't he? No, he hasn't, though. You're being a bit unfair on him. I think he's the kind of person, if you think about his career, who always do does well, does well at school, uh, does well at university, does well in business, and is managing, and did manage to become quickly, Prime Minister. That's a man who stays to it and is very confident. He's not some old buffer that can be pushed aside. He's not that he's not that sort of age group. He's not that sort of personality. So to imagine all you've got to do is to give him a bit of a this and a bit of that and he'll be gone is complete fantasy. The idea that reform somehow becomes the Conservative Party is also a long way from reality. It's possible in the end they might do that. Mm. But remember our first past the post system is dead against them in all sorts of ways. They're spread out across the country. It is. They don't have strong areas which they can guarantee they'll produce their MPs. Right. La Nigel Farage knows this well enough. He's tried more okay. than once and he knows the system will right. in fact say OK, you've got 15% of the vote or even more of the vote but you ain't got well, Alex, MPs. I've just rattled off quite a few cases there where Rishi Sunak does not appear to be behaving like a man who particularly cares about being re-elected. I mean, it's pretty clear. I mean, he's been following Elon Musk around the world last year. If you remember, he was at that summit with the Italian president, uh, prime minister even. And it, it, it's very obvious that Rishi is not a man that's going to carry the Conservative Party into an election victory. Look at his actions. We, you see reform polling where the Tories should be winning on immigration, on the economy. These are traditional Conservative values, and he is not grasping them. And I think it's by choice, because if he does tackle them aggressively, which this does need aggressive measures to be to have some resolution to them mm -hmm. then he would never be allowed back on the tech scene ever again probably like I won't ever be Patrick yeah, <laughs> yeah well, but that's it so the working class Tory voters of 2019 appear to have gone to reform he's doing particularly badly in the north and in the Midlands you also look at the 50 to 64 year age bracket and then I will have this exclusive with Robert Jeremy later. We played you a clip of it there. But, Joanna, yeah, he is there, the former immigration minister, saying he was trying to talk to our current prime minister about immigration and the prime minister was refusing. That's not a man who wants to get re-elected, is it? Well, I think that, you know, Rishi Sunak has tried, to be fair to him, and I don't usually um, defend him, but when it comes to even things that I actually think that personally he doesn't resonate with, like stopping the boats and being really hard on immigration, I think he has tried to an extent. But I completely agree with Alex in the sense that Rishi Sunak, to me, is another Tory career politician and he's thinking way ahead. He's thinking about Silicon Valley and people who are in that kind of arena are quite liberal. And I think that, you know, he wants to be accepted um, in those kind of uh, circumstances. So I think now it's got to the point where I've tried my best. It looks as if I'm just going to kind of cut my losses now and actually think about my future potentially in America. And that actually is a dereliction of duty for Britain, John, isn't it? Well, no, of course it is. But that's the, I, I think the mistake is to imagine that if he feels like that, yeah, if he if he thinks much about it, I imagine he's much more concerned about day to day and what he's doing. A very intense. But what job is he do? What evidence is there for that? Can I just well, ask? Have you got no, any you, evidence? You've got to make a guess about this. You've got to sort of say, how does that man get up in the morning? How does he work all day? What is he actually? What's on in his mind? I've observed lots of prime ministers over the years. I know what they. Do, they get locked into these aggressive schedules and the idea that he spends you know acres of time thinking oh and then I could go to California and I could do that I bet he isn't I bet he's thinking that we'll leave that let's see how we get on with this his success in exams and all the rest of it if you look at his career is someone who's got tremendous powers of concentration and who makes absolutely certain that he's not distracted by okay. what ifs in months time he doesn't but we have, we, have, we have around around 63 Conservative MPs, I think it is now, saying that they're not going to stand mm -hmm. for election mm -hmm. again. We've had a couple of cabinet ministers this week yep. saying that they're not going to stand again. Uh, we've had all sorts of issues taking place there with people throwing the towel in uh, around him. Um, uh, and we've also, like I was just saying there, got the former immigration minister saying he didn't particularly seem to care uh, about immigration. Uh, Alex, again, I, I just find that, find that quite 
bizarre, really. I mean, do you think his heart is really in it? No, absolutely not. He's, he's, he's completely devoid of any uh, ambition to win this election. I mean, look, this... this so you're saying he doesn't want it to do well, well in his job, because... That but, 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 the, but, but if he's being... If, if, if we say this is a guy who likes to win, and he, he, he's win, a he student, well. by all accounts, he's being marked D, E and F right now. He's got his Tory yeah. MPs being flood, uh, fleeing the but ship. They're jumping trying. off the ship. Tory party advisers leaving to Keir Stammen's yeah, Labour Party trying. today. To be fair, though, also to Rishi Sunak, and again, he's not somebody that I usually um, defend, but I think realistically, overall, a lot of these Tory parties who are uh, Tory MPs who are stepping down at the next election know that they've got no chance because of the last 14 years of absolute chaos. So I think this started way before Rishi Sunak. But, but particularly, the, the, particularly the last 18 months is where the polls have massively shifted against them. And what have we seen again yesterday? Rishi Sunak coming out going, oh, I was given a hospital pass by Boris Johnson. Oh, there's nothing I could do. There's absolutely nothing I could do. Well, that is almost an admittance of, of defeat as it is. Uh, Alex, you were alluding to the other news that might have escaped some of our, our viewers today is, is about some of the advisers now. Just would you explain what's going yeah, on there? Yes, so there's this great report in The Telegraph. Tory party advisers are fleeing the Conservative Party and they're going over to work for Keir Starmer's Labour Party. Not only does that show mm. how... how internally corrupt the Conservative Party is because it's got a bunch of career politicians in the making there who are literally jumping ship to ship to save their votes. But if I was a Labour voter, I'd be quite worried that my policy is now going to be infiltrated by a bunch of uh, Tory policy people. Or maybe it's... they just jump in ship because they realise that the whole thing is just a non-starter. You wouldn't jump There's ship. Just I mean, Joanna, you're a woman of values. Would you jump ship, ship to the Tories because you saw Labour losing? Would you jump ship? No, not because of that, but also I think it's because of just what the Tory party has become. The Tory party themselves are completely divided. So if I'm somebody who's going to be an advisor to them, I want to know what I'm actually signing up for. And I think a lot of people in the country doesn't know who I, they I, are. Well, I, I can agree more with you. But I, also, you're, more I think you. you're talking about minorities, too. Whenever I meet a, a Tory MP and I say, so what's going on? You've all gone mad. And he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. That's yeah. exactly yeah. the issue. Yeah. The idea they're all in a block behaving yeah, in a kind of... Sure. We, we've all given up, we've all done this, we don't know what to do. But one, one that thing, doesn't ring one thing that is absolutely beggars belief, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that Keir Starmer could now finally be up against the Privileges Committee. Now, as we understand it, and this is what my sources were saying earlier in the week, and it was reported elsewhere as well, was that it's the ultimate decision on this is going to be whether or not Rishi Sunak gives the nod to the Leader of the House, Penny Mordaunt, to actually push mm. ahead with this. Why on earth... Would you, as the Prime Minister, who's, say, 20 points behind in the polls, be presented with the opposition's metaphorical head on a platter and not press ahead with that? I mean, that, John, to me, is... is, is... I mean, just, well, unimaginable. I just don't understand why. how no, politically you, awful you, have you got to be to not do that. I'm sorry, it's because you've not worked at Westminster. You don't see that for them, the whole question Removing about... the leader of the opposition, no, John. I, no, 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 but it, it, in politics, it... Everything has got to be seen in context. It's not just one move and therefore that. There's always one move and another move and how about this? It's always He's more moving out at the minute, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's always more complicated. And it seems the straightforward view is still your Prime Minister, get on with it. <laughs> and if people but it's politics, stop, though, John. I mean, come on, he, this is a chess game. All if right. you've got an opportunity to take out your biggest rival, your biggest threat to you becoming staying as Prime Minister, I would take every opportunity. I mean, they did yeah, with Boris. All right. Okay. And, and, trust. and with trust, they took any chance they could, they threw the dagger and in. And you think politics is a cartoon game? It isn't. It's a little bit like well, Maybe one. he just no, realises that Keir Starmer actually didn't do anything wrong. Exactly. So his conscience is just speaking to him Be for once. Caref Be careful assuming there's a simple solution. Mm. Simple solutions at Westminster, are almost by definition, are wrong. All right. Mm. All right. He's playing chess, not checkers. OK, Maybe. all right. Well, look, we're, off to, we're off to a good start. We're off to a good start. Now, look, coming up, OK, a TV exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. And, yes, he is, unfortunately for Rishi, scathing about him. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration. It's a wide-ranging interview that is certainly well worth a watch, but I do say so myself. Is Ramadan more popular than Easter? Is another big topic that we'll be covering tonight. But up next... A Eurovision winner and a drag queen debate whether the UK should boycott this year's contest. Why? Because Queers for Palestine are telling us to. It's Patrick Christie's tonight on GB News.
Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health. Yeah. Men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people don't. People see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through um, two miscarriages. Oh, um, wow. You know, and you know, for us. That was a very devastating mm, of time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio. Whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was, is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm -hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and 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 we've been able to cry together. And they've they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually. You know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Now, coming up, an update on the King's health, actually, over Easter, so do stay tuned for that. But now, Queers for Palestine, some would call it an oxymoron, have published an open letter calling for the UK's Eurovision entry, Ollie Alexander, to boycott the competition. Well, are they right? It's time for tonight's Head to Head. So, Queers for Palestine, yes, that's a real thing, are asking UK representative Oli Alexander to pull out of Eurovision. And they're not the only ones. Prominent left-wing and LGBT journalist Owen Jones has joined the campaign. Now, many of you may think that the UK should boycott Eurovision every year, as it's normally a national embarrassment. The United Kingdom gets from the public Zero points. Well, Ollie is standing his ground, so he took to X to issue a statement insisting that he is taking part in the competition due to his belief in the unifying power of music. However, with over a month to run until one of the gay community's landmark events, 
you do wonder whether or not Oli will be able to hold the line. They, of course, want us to boycott Israel and therefore boycott Eurovision. So tonight I am asking, should the UK be boycotting Eurovision because of Israel's participation in the competition? Let me know your thoughts. GBviews at GBnews.com, at GBnews on Twitter. Go and vote in our poll. The results to follow shortly. But joining me now is political commentator Alex Armstrong and drag queen Amaya Napper. Both of you, thank you very, very much. Tremendous to get you on the show. Um, Amaya, I will start with you. Do you think that we should be boycotting Eurovision quiz for Palestine wants us to? I do. Um, I think considering Eurovision's historical stance on political songs and, for example, in 2021, Belarus were disqualified for having a song that was politically motivated. Um, they then put forward another song which wasn't politically motivated and they were still disqualified. Whereas Israel have put forward two songs that were both disqualified and they've still been allowed to use the same song that was originally disqualified with slightly different lyrics, which reference the October 7th attacks. Um, so if we're going purely on Eurovision rules, right. they should not be allowed to... So can, can I just ask for a bit of clarity on that? Just purely because I suspect that you might know a little bit more about this than I do. So you're saying that Israel have put forward a song that references the October 7th attacks, is that right? They put forward two songs, <laughs> two were disqualified, then one of the songs, which was called right. October Rain, and it is now called Hurricane, I believe, um, they changed a couple of words from the chorus, but it still okay. references the October 7th attacks. And that is just basic Eurovision rules. That's not even going into the fact that they're currently ethnically cleansing a whole state of people. And there we so, go. Right. Um, OK. Yeah. All right. Well, let's that, part that there for a second, uh, Amaya. So, Alex, I will throw it over to you. Um, it's Our track, for what it's worth, is apparently called Dizzy. I don't know if that contains any particular political messages. Uh, should we be boycotting uh, the Eurovision Song Contest because... Queers of Palatine have asked us to do so. No, I mean, absolutely not. It's ridiculous. First of all, let's remember that Eurovision is a democracy. At the end of the day, people get to vote, and if they don't like Israel's song, then surely it won't get many votes. I, I, in fact, I hope they do, because they are obviously... They suffered a massive terrorist attack on their country, which is why this war started in the first place. But, but let's just take a look at the organisation that's causing for this, uh, calling for this boycott, Queers for Palestine. I mean, it might as well be called Chickens for KFC, quite frankly, because those people are utterly delusional. There's not a single person in Palestine or many people in Palestine that would welcome anyone from the LGBT community. In fact, they, they, uh, it's, it's against the law. You'd be put in prison. And we've seen many people beheaded and killed on the streets of Palestine for far less uh, when it comes to LGBT rights. So for the fact that the queer community or the gay community, whatever you choose, to call yourselves, are now defending a state that is ad 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 hor abhorrently against them is absolutely baffling. Well, that's that's arguably the key Where point. Am I, am I, can, I, can I ask you a question that's... on that, then? Can I, can I ask you a question yes. on that? I mean, I mean this with, with absolute respect, right, which is that, mm. you know, uh, if you did go to Gaza, you might be tortured and killed. So there's a lot of misinformation in what you just said. Um, if you were to go to Gaza... The law in Gaza regarding homosexuality is actually an antiquated law that has been held on from the British rule. So it was oh, a British gosh. mandate, actually. It was not a Gazan citizen. That is you not know, a You do Gazan know, law. though, am I, that Hamas in don't, the West Hamas, Bank, Hamas there are no don't laws like in the gay West people, Bank right? against homosexuality. And the misinformation that has been... Israel have been um, blackmailing queer Palestinians into becoming collaborators. Right. Now, you'll find that that is the reason why there is so much taboo around being queer in Palestine now. Yes, <sighs> culturally speaking, culturally speaking, homosexuality is not a part of the culture, but... Nowadays, right. 
Well, the well, problem look, look. is that Israel have weaponized that. Right. No, they haven't. Look, the people, people of Gaza have weaponized yes, have. it. There was a man killed just in 2022. For, uh, his body was found by state authorities there, and he was, was killed most likely due to due to his his sexuality. Was his name uh, the reality is is that there is not a. He the, was not killed because he was a homosexual. He was killed because the Shin mm. Bet had a videotape of him having sex with a man. And right. they blackmailed him into collaborating right. with them. And when the Palestinian resistance found right. out, they I... beheaded him as a traitor, and it had nothing to right. do but, with him but being I, I would argue. I would argue, Amaya, though, I mean, regardless of why they beheaded him, they beheaded a man, right? And, and maybe they might be worse than the Israelis? The Israelis have been committing atrocities since 1948. Okay. So if you cage a whole state of people and you don't allow them to have basic human rights or food or access to health care mm. and you increase that as the years go on, you cannot expect them... I get what you're saying. I, I imagine Alex might disagree with that. And certainly when it comes to the gay rights thing, I mean, Israel is seen as a, a bastion of gay rights in the Middle East, Alex. It's the only... It's the only Israel is the only... Hang on, Amaya, let me talk. Um, Israel, is the, Israel is the only state in the Middle East that has liberal LGBT laws. Let's just get the facts straight. There. Nobody's buying that if an LGBT person walked into Gaza, that they wouldn't be attacked, shot or killed. No one's buying that. It doesn't matter how much propaganda the queers of Palestine put out and how much spin they do. No one's buying this that if you walked in as an LGBT, a trans person walked into, or a drag queen walked into <laughs> Gaza, you wouldn't last five minutes, quite frankly. So let's just be clear about that. If you go to Israel, you will be, you are protected. There are even police there to protect uh, LGBT parts of the city from any extremists whatsoever. So there's a huge difference in the mm. culture, in the norms, in the religious values that protect the people of those two different states as well. And let's just be honest, Israel is the only place, and you can, you, right. you, you can just look at the facts, Israel is the only place in the Middle East that has good LGBT laws. It's the only place that you'd be able to go and be safe. According okay. to Western propaganda. No, it's not. It's just a fact. It's just an absolute fact on their it's laws. Not a fact. It is a fact. Do some it's research. Not a fact. Go and read the laws of every state in the Middle East and tell me which one is the only one that has that has positive and attributing uh, LGBT rights. It, and, and none of them are, none of the others do. In fact, they suppress LGBT people. So the fact that you guys are yeah, calling like to support a state, uh, a, a state that is being, you know, a, a, a oppressing LGBT people and murdering them for so long is absolutely insane. All, all right, we'll, go, we'll, let, we'll, let, we'll let Amaya come back to that. And could I also just ask you, Amaya, as well, I think you might have frozen, actually, on us there. Oh, that's a shame. OK, all right, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get it back. Um, yeah, I mean, look, hey, it's a debate. Alex, I'll just bring you back into it, I suppose, then why not? Um, look, Alex, I, I mean, I suppose an argument would be, right, which is that if there is such a strong strength of feeling amongst people at the moment that uh, the likes of Amaya have, then maybe Oli Alexander, if he wants to preserve his career and his reputation as, quotes, unquote, a queer icon, as Owen Jones calls him, then actually he's in a tremendously difficult position now, isn't it? Uh, I mean, should we be even allowing... Should we be even be allowing Israel in Eurovision? I mean, it's not in Europe. I mean, look, there's, I'm not a huge fan of uh, Eurovision myself, Patrick, but, you know, I have indulged in it a couple of times. It's great fun. Uh, the fact that it gets politicised almost every year is nothing new to anyone that watches it. Let's not forget that the UK's received zero points after Brexit, okay. zero points after the wars. Despite none of those songs have any political messaging right. in them whatsoever. So maybe it's the viewers who are a, a, a political right. people, quite frankly. Look, Alex, thank you for stepping it. into this. I believe, I believe that we've got Amaya, great stuff. All right, Amaya is back now. Look, final, final word to you, Amaya, and thank you very much for coming on and taking part uh, in this debate. What would your message to Oli Alexander be? If he goes ahead with his performance, OK, is that him? Is he, is he dead to the, the queer community, is he? Look, I can't speak for the whole queer community. I'm, I'm just a drag queen. I would just say to think it through very carefully because the statement that Ollie put out, mm. I think is frankly quite insulting um, and doesn't acknowledge the gravity of the situation. Boycotts have been working all over the world. Everyone has seen it with, whether it's McDonald's or large corporations. This boycott okay. would be 
quite a statement. Um, and it's not, you know, it's it's more than just about okay. fun songs and, you know, it's, All right. it's people's lives. Oh. Uh, OK, all right, look, all right, both of you, thank you. Yet again, we asked for a head-to-head. -head. We certainly got a head-to-head, -head, so great stuff. All right, um, look, who do you agree with, OK? Queers of Palestine want the UK to boycott Eurovision, should we? Jen on X says, we shouldn't boycott Eurovision, but we should leave it. It's a massive waste of money. And despite claiming to be apolitical, it's more political than a general election. Anthea says, they can boycott it all they want. I won't be. It's one of the highlights of my year. Pam says... Yes, but not because they want us to, because it's rubbish and fixed. Right, OK. Look, your verdict is in. A very specific 86.3% of you say, no, we should not boycott Eurovision because Queers for Palestine want us to. 13.7% of you say that we should. Uh, some quite revealing things, I thought, there in that head-to-head. -head. But uh, anyway, moving on. Coming up, a TV exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. Yes, he does tee off rather a lot on Rishi Sunak. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration. And a big announcement on King Charles's health. Also, as well, is Ramadan now more popular than Easter? It certainly seems to be in certain parts, doesn't it? But next, is it ever OK for parents to smack their kids to teach them discipline? I'm asking this because we seem to be seeing a heck of a lot of feral kids at the moment. Patrick Christie tonight on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us we've continued to see the mix of some sunshine but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area low pressure which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere turning clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they'd promised, I can't imagine 
that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Now, I've lost count of how many times that I've been out in public and there have been children, feral children, causing a scene. The most recent case is hundreds of school kids storming a shopping centre in Milton Keynes. Now, a member of the public was afraid that they were running from a shooting or an attack or something like that. They were screaming. Well, then it turned out, you know, shops locked their doors in panic and actually they were just trying to loot the place. One bystander said it was really scary as there were maybe 200 kids just running with no regard for anyone around them. They were swearing at security, were doing an amazing job, but with so many kids, they had no hope of getting it under control. So, with young people thinking that they can just rule the roost, and by the way, I mean, that was one of arguably the more mild-mannered situations there, as bad as that was, you know, they seem to be stabbing each other left, right and centre at the moment, massively disrespecting police officers is another thing. Look, have parents completely lost control of their children? We've had conversations already today on GB News about, well, what do you do? Do you put them all in young offenders institutes? Do you, do you find the parents? Do you send the parents to prison? Well, I'm just wondering, actually, whether or not... Is it ever OK to smack your kids to teach them discipline? I'm delighted to be joined now by a behavioural and media psychologist. It's the wonderful Joe Hemmings. Joe, thank you very, very much. I'm going to front up to this immediately and just say, I don't have any kids. Uh, but is it ever OK? Is it ever OK to smack your kids to teach them discipline? Does it have any effect? Hello, Patrick. I mean, look, I'm not in favour of smacking. I am only if they're in imminent danger. So kids sticking their fingers in sockets or mm. going near, you know, water with some sort of electricity. Yes, you've got to smack a child to immediately remove them from that danger. No, these are sort of teenagers. There's this group mob anarchic mentality. So if you're asking me how parents forgotten about disciplining their children. Now, discipline mm. is a bit of a dirty word these days, but it's incredibly important. You can't forget it. So each and one of those children, of that 200 mob, has a parent or a guardian that needs to take some responsibility for what they're doing and where they are. And if they find out they're part of that group, then there ought to I be... Just, I just wonder with that, Joe, though. Yeah, I just wonder with that, though, Joe, you know, they were there in the school uniform, uh, their faces, yeah. not a lot of the faces were covered. I mean, you... Presumably, unless you're especially thick as one of those children, you know that there's a relatively good chance that that video yes. is going to end up getting back to your mum or dad. OK? Uh, the implication I took from that is that they didn't really care. And I just wonder if it just means that p p kids aren't afraid of their parents anymore and whether or not a little bit of physical discipline every now and again does bring back that, I would argue, maybe quite healthy fear from time to time. No, I'm not in favour of physical discipline, but I am, especially at that age, because I think it's kind of pointless. But I do think kids have gone wild. I do think parents need to discipline them. I mean, look, we've had so many stories in the news lately. Kids are five years old, going to school, still in nappies. What were those parents doing, doing during COVID? Yeah. Clearly not going anywhere near potty training. One in five kids, one in five teachers report kids have hit them in the last couple of years. I mean, there is definitely a, a run of really lousy behavior going on that parents have to be accountable for in some way. But what, what do we do about it? I mean, that, that's astonishing. Is it, what was it? One in five teachers have been hit by a pupil? Yes. I mean, I, look, I don't yeah. know about when you were at school. I mean, I never saw anything like that I, I, at all. No. I, I think, I think that, that's the kind of thing that might have made the headlines a while ago as a one-off, yeah. let alone now with the yeah. fact that it's, it's one in five kids. What, what can we do about that? Because there is a discipline issue here. They don't fear the police. They don't fear security guards. You know, they obviously don't fear teachers and they obviously don't fear their parents. I mean, how do we do... How do we get better at this without think, physical well, action? Look, there is no point in smacking or hitting. In fact, it's against the law, you know, a 13, 14, 15-year-old. It's about respect. It's about getting to recognise boundaries. Look, when they're in a group like this and they're all anarchic, it's like Lord of the Flies, they're going crazy, it's very different to an individual stabbing another one on a train. Let's not conflate some of these behaviours, but that particular group behaviour today, yeah, they want to be seen. That's part of the whole social media roundabout of gathering them together. They want to be seen on screen. It's disrespectful. It's offensive. And parents have to teach their children the old-fashioned matter of respect. And, and I sort of think that's gone out of the window a bit. And it does come down to the parents. It comes down to the relationships they have with their children and giving them good 
manners, decency. Mm. These are all old-fashioned words, but they're incredibly important. You know, something else that might be a bit old-fashioned now, and by the way, I'm you know not casting aspersions whatsoever on, on mothers here. I mean, I, I, no, I'm, I'm too afraid of my own mother to have done that for a start. But yeah, fatherless homes. Is there an issue there, do you think? The breakdown of the nuclear family, we see a lot more divorces as well. That doesn't always mean the father's absent, of course. But you know, I just wonder, is, is, this an, is this an issue now? Is, 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 you know, do kids do better if their dad's around? Look, I think one good parent is better than two lousy parents, you know, that aren't getting on. You know, it's tough at the moment. There's a cost of living crisis. People have to go to work and leave their kids in various sorts of care or the after school clubs, they can't do it, they're latchkey kids. Remember those? Come yeah. home, feed yourself, your tea's there. I mean, when kids don't have the boundaries, yeah, they are gonna go a bit wild. I mean, it's it's rough times at the moment and I hope it's, it's a bit of a hangover from COVID. It's a bit of a cost of living crisis. It's a mm. bit of a parenting, forgetting how to do stuff because they wouldn't have done it in their day. It's a combination of factors that actually need to be addressed. Do those kids, like the ones we saw in that video, I don't know if we might be able to bring that up again uh, at some point, like the ones we saw in that video and others like them and the ones that are going around firing fireworks at police officers, whatever they do, do they grow up to be terrible adults as well? Look, not necessarily. This is a big group mentality. You take each of those kids individually and I can assure you at least 50 or 60 percent will be pretty appalled at what they've done, but they're in a group and that mm. sort of group think mentality, that anarchy, that chaos they cause, they don't take accountability individually because they're in a big group doing it. And that's actually quite, you know, a frightening thing. But again, parents have to take those kids, they recognize their own children from that video. Where were you? Were you there? I recognize you. It's not a feather in your cap. We need to talk about this. And just to very finally, Joe, just to reiterate, I mean, from your, from your, you know, experience, I suppose, in this field as a behavioral psychologist, there is no evidence that you think that Children who are I'm not talking about abused at the home here at all. I'm talking about the kind of you know smack that might have been dished out a bit more regularly in the past. You don't think there's any evidence between between that happening with younger children and them being more disciplined? No, I'd like you to. I know you'd like me to say that there no, is. I no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm intrigued because this is this is the point. If you think that the answer to that is no, then that's the answer, and that's and that that puts this to bed. To suggest. The opposite, that if they're smacked, if they're hit, they think it's OK to do it to other people. So actually the evidence goes against physical punishment in that way, certainly at that age, unless they are literally toddlers mm. playing with something or about doing something incredibly dangerous like running to the road. That is the only time. Yeah, Joe, look, really interesting stuff. And thank you very, very much for that, because I think that has been one of the big questions. I've been, I've been glued to the GB Views inbox today, because I was covering the show earlier on, and there was a load of comments earlier on about, oh, these kids need a good smack and stuff. And I was thinking, well, actually, does it make a difference? But, Joe, thank you very, very much. It's Joe Hemmings there, who is behavioural and media psychologist. Now, yes, TV exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick is on the way. One of the issues, big issues, uh, here on this show, and it has been for a number of weeks now, is about just trying to be able to access the information as to whether or not asylum seekers are committing sexual assaults and whether we can access that information. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later on, but I did ask Mr Jamrick, the former immigration minister, directly about this. Did see uh, some very concerning incidents, for example, at the asylum hotels, uh, individuals committing sexual assault that interview is just around the corner. Uh, also, is Ramadan more popular than Easter? We'll be discussing that. But next, a King Charles Health update. Yes, that's right. It's Patrick Christie tonight, and we are on GB News. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, 
The part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer but... stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they're just thinking election cycles. Absolutely. They just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always is looking ahead at actually politics aside what is genuinely the best thing for this country gb news is the home of free speech we were created to champion it and we deliver it day in day out free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us our families and of course the british people having challenging conversations to enlighten each other which is why we hear all sides of the argument we are the people's channel we will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. We are, of course, on GB News. Well, some potentially very important royal news now. King Charles is set to make his first appearance since beginning his cancer treatment. However, he will sit apart from the rest of the royal family at the Easter service as a precaution to protect his health. Now, the king is hoping to walk to and from St George's Chapel in Windsor, apparently, but uh, will probably not be attending a post-service reception. There is a bit more to this as well. Should we be concerned, or well, more concerned, really, for our king? Joining me to discuss this now is the editor-at-large of the Mail on Sunday, Charlotte Griffith. Charlotte, thank you very, very much. So, this is concerning. It does appear like they're trying to minimise the amount that we can actually see. King Charles at times. It, well, it is kind of concerning, but the whole reason this is being staged is because they want to, you know, calm us all down. Because we haven't seen Charles for a really long time, and Kate's obviously made her announcement about being ill. So actually, I think they've really wanted this event to happen so that we feel reassured. But as you say, slightly less reassuring that he's going to be sitting apart from the rest of the congregation to protect his health, so we can only assume that he's somehow immunosuppressed and they don't want him to catch any bugs from the congregation. But also what they've done, which is quite clever, is he'll be walking down to the service, but then from that point onwards, he won't be seen because um, St George's Chapel is within the grounds of the castle. So they've chosen an event where... He won't be on camera for hours and hours on end. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so while it is a little bit concerning, they're trying, you know, the Royal Aids are sort of hoping actually for the opposite effect, that seeing him at last will assure us that he's OK. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't appear like he'll be taking the Easter lunch afterwards, apparently, because he's, he's on his, his gentle steps in his first yes. return uh, to uh, public life, as it were. And we didn't actually see him, did we, when he did his Easter message? So no. I know that raised a few eyebrows. That raised a few eyebrows because he recorded an audio um, recording a few 
weeks actually before. And then they said, well, that's because the Worcestershire Cathedral um, didn't have the visual capabilities to have live video streaming. But then people wondered, well, why can't he do a live audio recording? Mm. Um, but, you know, they, had, they explained it all the way. And I think they're very keen to do that, the aides, and they're very keen to unveil this um, weekend as a step, a slow and gentle step is the narrative that's being pushed out towards him returning to public duty. Mm. But, you know, the fact is, he, we're not going to suddenly see him, you know, every five minutes at Royal events. However, he has done three engagements this week, but they were behind closed doors. We saw stills, as we we become quite used to now with Charles, is seeing stills of him doing mm. meet and greets. Um, actually, this will be his fourth engagement in a week, which for somebody who's battling cancer, absolutely, pretty hardcore, actually. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there is also the very obvious uh, issue of if somebody is ill and if somebody is battling cancer and we don't know entirely, I think, Dewey, about exactly what treatments you might be going through mm -hmm. for that, then I suppose they do deserve privacy. Maybe we should just be grateful to get a little glimpse of him as he's walking in. Yeah, I think so. I think he's slightly less private than Kate. So Kate's obviously is not going to be present at all at this at this service. Right. And she's away for the whole of Easter. We're not going to see her anymore, which is part of the reason he's being rolled out a little bit. Um, but he's been, you know, right from the off, he's been quite open about what's wrong with him. Admittedly, not his exact type of cancer or his treatment. Um, so, you know, I think I think he will push the boundaries. And I think he knows, just like the Queen always taught him, you have to be seen to be believed. And that's why we had the Kate hysteria, because we just didn't see her for so long. And Charles isn't going to fall into that trap. He's going to try and be seen. And yes, we have to sort of respect his privacy, but he knows, he knows that he needs to give a little bit as well and, and be seen. So, if anything, really, this is potentially a quite a brave king story, really, that despite everything that is going on, he is, it appears anyway, going to be seen in public for a, a brief window of time. It's his fourth engagement of the week. He is yeah. at least attending the service as well. I mean, that is quite bold of him, really. I think it's really bold, and I think he's doing it genuinely out of a sense of duty. And he said in that Mondi service speech that was pre-recorded, he said, you know, he feels his duty is to serve and not be served and this is sort of a sort of gesture towards that I think he's saying look I am the monarch I am the king I know you know many people want to actually see the monarchy um, thriving but they just literally can't do that at the moment because Kate's ill and he's ill so I think he's sort of forcing himself out there and of course he's putting in careful boundaries around this event so that if he does get tired mm. we <laughs> the nation won't all you know have a fit of hysteria that he missed the lunch it's better for him to just you know say right I'm going to finish before the lunch mm. and do a short walk because he knows that there's this hysteria that could come out. Well, Charlotte, thank you very, very much. It's really great to have your insight into that. So that's Charlotte Griffiths there, who is the editor of the Mail... Sorry, Mail on Sunday. Uh, editor at large. Yes, you are indeed. There we go. I'll get that right one day. Anyway, right, OK, look, a TV exclusive with former immigration minister Robert Jemrick coming your way. He does discuss sexual assaults taking place in migrant hotels. So make sure that you stay tuned for all of that very important stuff. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us we've see, continued to see the mix of some sunshine but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area, low pressure, which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere, turn and clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration. Yes, a TV exclusive with Robert Jemrick. He knows what's really going on. Uh, some very concerning incidents, for example, at the asylum hotels, uh, individuals committing sexual assault. He thinks that we should all be able to know the truth. Also... Is Ramadan now more popular than Easter and... Um, oh, we've got breaking news. David Lamy has just dropped a massive clangor. I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you tonight with Apprentice finalist Joanna Jarju. Political commentator Alex Armstrong and XITV political chief John Sargent. Oh, yes, and I will be telling you what on earth is happening here. Oh, uh, no! It does get worse. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. There is an issue with asylum seeker sex attackers. Next. Patrick, thank you and a very good evening to you from the GB newsrooms. Just gone 10 o'clock and we start with news from Northern Ireland tonight, where the new leader of the Democratic Unionist Party has today condemned what he calls conspiracy theories and cheap political point scoring following criminal charges brought against Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. The shock resignation of the DUP's former leader and the longest-serving MP in Northern Ireland came after he was accused of serious historical sex offences. Gavin Robinson was unanimously appointed as the interim leader for the party earlier. He says the charges against Donaldson were a devastating revelation. Things caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland. It came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so in the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. 
Rishi Sunak is facing criticism for awarding a major Conservative donor a knighthood as part of a controversial honours list. Sir Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. Labour, though, have condemned the award as what they've called an arrogant act of an entitled man, adding that donations shouldn't be an automatic pass to honours. Well, as we mentioned in the last hour, a journalist working for Iran International is recovering after what's been described as a cowardly and deeply shocking knife attack outside his home in London. Police and paramedics responded to the scene this afternoon where that victim, in his 30s, was found with stab wounds, though he's not thought to be in a life-threatening condition. The attack is now, we understand, being investigated by specialist counter-terrorism officers to confirm whether it's connected to the Iranian regime. Well, it follows Lord Cameron's recent condemnation of Iran's targeting of journalists, including a recent alleged plot to assassinate two television reporters working for Iran TV here in Britain. Police have issued an urgent appeal to help locate a dis disabled boy's specially modified van. The Carriazzo family's 13-year-old son, Elijah, has a rare, life-limiting muscular condition. His custom vehicle, seen here if you're watching on television, is CCTV footage showing the moment it was stolen. That van was used to transport vital medical equipment. Elijah's mother, Anessa, hopes that the van is returned before her son's birthday, which she said could be their last holiday together. It's not the van that you took, but it's our freedom as a family, his freedom as to whatever life he's got, he's got a limited time here and we just hope that you pull something in your heart to look at this as not a material thing but look at this as what you could give to elijah into whatever life whatever we could squeeze in to whatever limited time we've got Meanwhile, one of the UK's largest school photo firms has apologised after it offered families the option of class pictures with or without children with complex needs. Parents in Aberdeenshire have expressed their anger after being sent two versions of a class photo to choose from, with one excluding classmates with additional needs. The mother of one of those children who was excluded from a class photo said it was heartbreaking to see her child effectively, she said, erased from history. Well, Tempest Photography have said that what happened is not standard procedure and that they are taking the matter very seriously. And finally, in Canada, a state of emergency has been declared as Niagara Falls braces for record crowds during an upcoming total solar eclipse. The dramatic natural wonder, wonder situated along the Canadian-US border is in the path of that eclipse coming up on the 8th of April. The region's authorities say the decision has been made out of an abundance of caution to manage the biggest crowds of visitors ever expected to flock to the popular waterfalls. Well, with up to a million sightseers and stargazers predicted, many people are already splurging on hotels, securing their spot to experience the rare sight. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good evening. This week, we've seen both a record number of channel migrant crossings with 4,644 this year and an issue with legal migration. Because again this week, more legal migrants have come to this country to fulfil jobs in care homes that didn't even exist. And then, of course, there were multiple manhunts for alleged crimes ranging from unprovoked stabbings to the sexual assault of schoolgirls. But the big story for us here at GB News is that we think the public deserves to know the truth when it comes to how many asylum seekers have committed sex offences. The Ministry of Justice rejected our Freedom of Information request on the grounds that it would cost them too much money. We then offered to pay for it. They still rejected it. We will appeal that decision. However, there may be another way to get this information. Now, this is the first of my two-part interview with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. I began by asking him if he thinks the public has a right to know if we have people with pending visa and asylum applications who are dangerous sex offenders. 
I want the most honest and transparent debate about immigration, legal or illegal, that we can possibly have. And it is wrong that the government or other agencies hide statistics. And so, following your very important campaign, I have laid an amendment to the upcoming Criminal Justice Bill, which tackles one of these issues, and it says that the government must publish statistics on crimes and sentences by country of origin and by visa and asylum status. And so if the government accepts this or we win in Parliament, then from now on we will have this information. And we don't know what this will show. Mm. It may be that it shows that there are some surprisingly uh, interesting statistics that some people coming to our country are extremely law-abiding, more law-abiding than British citizens, or it may show the opposite. But what matters here is that we have the information and that we can have an honest debate as we set policy. It's worth noting as well that we've been in communication with the Ministry of Justice on this. Um, they initially said to us that they do hold the information, but it would cost too much money to be able to get it. We offered to pay for it. They've said, no, can't pay for it. We're just not getting it. So I think the nation is really relying on your, uh, your, your thing going through that. What's the kind of uptake been on it? How are you seeing that, that come to fruition? What would be the process in order to get that across the line? Well, we've laid the amendment and I've asked all MPs whether they would like to support me. And we've already had dozens of members of parliament putting their names to it from all sections and wings of the Conservative Party, from Jacob Rees-Mogg to Robert Buckland, and I think that shows just how important it is that we actually have a proper, honest debate that is based on facts. Mm. And so it is incumbent on the government to get those facts into the public domain. I think that the public want to know who's coming into our country and what the economic, the fiscal and the societal impact of immigration is. And as I say, some of that will undoubtedly be positive. Yeah. Some will not. And we just need to make sure the facts are in the public domain. Absolutely. Just. When you were immigration minister, you must have seen a bit behind the curtain. I know that we've spoken previously about some nefarious characters that unfortunately have made their way to our shores. Do you have any idea at all? Do you think that there is stuff that needs to be put out there when it comes to the potential for asylum seekers, some asylum seekers, to be you know, committing crimes, really? Mm. I do, and I did see uh, some very concerning incidents, for example, at the asylum hotels or the accommodation that the Home Office was housing people in, uh, individuals committing sexual assault. And I think it's important that we actually get this information out into the public domain for the first time. There are people coming to this country uh, who do us harm. There are people coming from countries who don't share our Western liberal values and attitudes towards women and minorities. And we need to be open and honest about that. And there are other countries around the world, Denmark, for example, that publishes data. I was recently in Texas and in the United States. They publish data about the crimes and offences being caused by illegal migrants. Let's do the same here in the UK and have an honest debate. Yeah, it's about that, isn't it? It's about honest debate. It's about having all of the information at our disposal so we can have that debate. Um, let's talk about some of the people that we know about who are already here, mm. who are committing offences. Now, you have unearthed some quite astonishing statistics, actually, which I will let you run through, but this is about hyper-prolific offenders and their rate of reoffending. Go on. Well, look, we all want to live in a safer country. And one of the ways to tackle that is to address those people who are committing the most crimes. And the statistics are really shocking. They show that more than 50% of all of the convictions for criminal offence in this country are, con uh, uh, um, are done by just 9% of people. Remarkable. And there are even people who are committing 45 offences, a single individual in the last 12 months. That is completely wrong. We've got to address this properly Without for the first time. Without being sent to prison. Without being sent to prison. And prison is for many different things. It's for punishment, it's for rehabilitation, but it's also for public safety and to get the most prolific and dangerous people off the streets of our country. And so what I'm calling for is a different approach to the one we've had in recent years. It is that we lock up more of these prolific offenders and just get them off our streets keep the public safe. Mm. And to do that, we will need to build more prisons. 
But I don't flinch from that. I think we have to embrace that if it is a way of keeping the public safe. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm calling on the government today is to build more prisons, to embrace a national mission of building more prisons, mm -hmm. getting the most dangerous and prolific offenders off the streets and keeping the public safe. C conceivably, I know it will not be as black and white as this, but conceivably then, if the worst 9% were locked up, there is the potential for crime to be reduced by f about 52%. Yeah, I think it would have a very big and immediate impact on crime. Yeah. And it's also a statement about what kind of country we want to live in. I think you and I would agree that we want to live in a country where people are given a second chance. Mm. I don't think people necessarily should be given a third or fourth or fifth chance. I certainly don't think people should be given a 45th chance. And so let's have a fundamentally different approach to crime, locking up these prolific offenders and keeping the public much more safe. So that's the first part of that interview. Now, in the second part, Mr Jemrick makes some astonishing claims about the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and how little he appears to care about record levels of immigration. But there's quite a lot for us to react to there. And here to do it is the Apprentice finalist entrepreneur, Joanna Jarju, political commentator Alex Armstrong, and ex-ITV and BBC political top dog, John Sargent. Look, two topics that we dealt with there. I'd like us to deal with both of them now. Uh, the first one is that Robert Jemrick is proposing and asking MPs to sign up to an update, an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill that would mean that every 12 months, basically, the relevant Secretary of State would have to publish the information which would be crime by nationality. So that would include nationality and visa or asylum status of every offender convicted in the courts of England and Wales in the previous 12 months. Alex, do we have a right to know this? Oh, absolutely we do. And, and I'm rather shocked that we don't know this information. And the fact that GB News has tried to get this information as a, as a news outlet mm. uh, and then report on it just goes back to these, these statements which people say, oh, they're mad, they're mad, this deep state comment, but is, is there a deep state trying to hide information from the public? Well, when you hear things like this, you begin to wonder, well, is that statement actually true? Why are we not publishing these statistics? Why is this only coming to light now? This should be on public record for anybody who enters the country and, quite frankly, for anyone who lives in Britain. It's, it's, it's absolutely bonkers. Yeah, and so, look, as it stands, I've said again, we are going to appeal this FOI rejection decision, but Mr Jemmett there, John, does appear to have a way around this, which is that he can get this amendment. At the time that we recorded that interview anyway, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, he says he had about 40 to 5 to 50 MPs who had signed mm. that letter, so, you know, presumably the momentum is building here. We don't know what that number is right now. I'll ask you the same question, though. You know, do you think that we have, as a British public, the right to know... What is going on? I mean, he says there, as former immigration minister, he knows for a fact that we have imported criminals and some of them are sex criminals. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's perfectly straightforward. I Obviously, from a journalist's point of view, we always want to know more things and more information. The only slight sort of concern I've got is how much detail do you give and how, how much do you narrow down the areas you're talking about? Because there is a problem of increasing racial tension. Mm. And you've got to make sure that what you do doesn't, in fact, inflame situations which needn't be inflamed. Now, this is quite different from saying, overall, what's going on? What are the overall figures? So I suspect that for experts in these yep. areas, they want a bit more detail as to how much you're going to publish and how much you're going to go on publishing and making sure you don't offend the public good, that's all. OK, um, Joanna, uh, again, Robert Jemrick has followed up now the interview that we've done here with an article that will be in The Telegraph tomorrow calling for, well, essentially, a migrant crime league table, referencing what's going on in Denmark, where you can see that people from Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon, Somalia have far, riot, far higher rates of criminality than the native Danes. Mm. Is that something you think that we should be able to know here so we can add that to our discussion when we're talking about either illegal immigration or, dare I say, even net migration legally? Well, does the country have a right to know? Absolutely, yes. I think we have a right to know everything and anything. Um, but my thing with this is, what is it actually going to change? Because, you know, they know roundabout who's coming on these boats, for example, when we're looking at illegal migration and asylum seekers. But instead of focusing on that, I almost feel as if this is just going to be another talking point. So if he does actually get this over the line, 
then it gets to the point where we discuss it, but actually, what is he actually doing about it? So he's talking about, you know, the crimes that are being committed at the hotels. It, I think the issue will be with it would be much harder for politicians to try to sweep it under the rug. If it was known... I, I, again, I do want to emphasise, I'm at pains to emphasise, mm that you know, we do not know, by definition, what these figures are going to show. It might show... I know a lot of people would argue that one you know, sex attacker is one too many, yeah, and it is, but it might not show a massive correlation. It might not show that the numbers are disproportionately high among asylum seekers, etc. You know, and, and so there is that side of well, things. Well, this is but the... we would know one way or the other then, wouldn't we, is the thing. This is the point, right? We, ca we have to deal with facts. If we don't have facts, we can't make informed decisions. Mm. And it's in the public interest to know what the facts are. And we shouldn't be shy of the facts because we might offend people and upset but them. But even if you know the facts, though, Alex, you know the facts, but the point is, all these people are coming through irregular means. Yeah. Some of them are actually illegal and, mm. you know, uh, economic migrants, but also some of them are genuine asylum seekers. Mm. And no matter mm. what stats we actually publish, mm. they're still going to end up in these hotels. We're still going to be paying £8 million well, a day for well, it. Well, it, it, so it then... might make us more inclined to adopt a, a tough approach. Again, just want to emphasise, we're going to play you the second part of that Robert Jemrick interview shortly, but the exclusive that we've got for you there, really, which I will bring to you again, is that Robert Jemrick is looking to put forward an amendment to the criminal justice bill that would mean that the nationality and visa status of offenders would be brought into the public domain. He says he has a lot of backing from that. We're going to follow it all the way here, and that is, frankly, the way around what appears to be an attempt, anyway, to hide that information from us. So there we go. Look, coming up, uh, we are going to be discussing, of course, as Easter is upon us now, whether or not Ramadan is more popular than Easter in some quarters. But next, yes, we hear the rest of that exclusive interview with Robert Jemrick and, well, some incredible revelations, anyway, about his relationship with Rishi Sunak and Rishi Sunak's apparent uh, lack of interest when it came to mass immigration. You don't want to miss it. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer but... stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they're just thinking election cycles. Absolutely. They just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always is looking ahead, uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. 
GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's tonight. Uh, now, this is the second instalment of my interview with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. Now, Rishi Sunak has repeatedly claimed to care about legal immigration. He has repeatedly said that he wants to bring net migration down. What you're about to hear from a man who was supposed to have fortnightly meetings with the Prime Minister on the topic of immigration is quite staggering. Here it is. Interest or listen to, I should say, with some interest, a um, piece that you did uh, with Alison Pearson, who's a regular panellist on this show. Uh, it appeared, my understanding from this, was that you had to do quite a bit of convincing for Rishi Sunak when it comes to him taking immigration seriously mm. and actually looking to cuss it in any way, shape or form. Does he really take it seriously, do you think, when it comes to mass immigration? Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration to the British public. It was an issue that I have cared about for a long time. I shared that conviction with Suella Braverman, the, the Home Secretary at the time. She and I met the Prime Minister approximately every fortnight to talk about Home Office issues like stopping the boats, like security and policing. Never once did we have a conversation about legal migration because the Prime Minister didn't want to talk about it. And so ultimately, the conversation that I had with him in uh, November and early December was after I'd made it clear to him and the people around him that this was unsustainable. I wasn't willing to continue uh, in my role as immigration minister unless we tackled legal migration. And we did as a result of that. We announced uh, within days of having a proper meeting uh, a significant set of measures that will cut legal migration by 300,000. But again, to me, that was a beginning, not an end. And since I left office, we've seen no further measures. Whilst I think we need to get that down to the tens of thousands, mm. something much more sustainable for this country. I think people will find it absolutely astonishing, especially for a Conservative Prime Minister, there appeared to be no real appetite to engage in the migration discussion, despite himself saying numerous times publicly that you know, he, he really did have it as one of his top priorities. He wanted to reduce net migration. Look, there's a lot of noises, Mr Jemrick, about whether or not the Prime Minister will see it to the next election and what could happen to the Conservative Party after the next election if he does. Would you consider being running for leader of the Tory party or being Prime Minister? Well, I, I don't think that is the question at the moment. We have a Prime Minister in Rishi Sunak. And, and the point I've tried to make since I resigned is actually that this isn't primarily about personalities. It's about the course of the country. And I think there needs to be a change, of course. One of those areas is in immigration. Mm. We're clearly going down the wrong path. We're living in a country with net migration of six or 700,000, and we're not stopping the boats. In fact, the numbers crossing the channel are currently increasing. So whatever happens before or after the next general election, what matters to me is that we have a fundamentally different approach to some of these key issues. Mm. And as we just discussed a moment ago, I would add to that crime because I want a fundamentally different approach to how we keep our streets safe and we tackle those persistent offenders. Just, just so I'm clear on something before I let you get going, then when you were having your fortnightly meetings with the Prime Minister, predominantly about illegal immigration, would you try to talk about legal immigration and, and it was just battered away? Yes. You know, both Suella uh, and I wrote on a number of occasions, often together, uh, sometimes on our own, I wrote privately to the Prime Minister, setting out the case for reducing legal migration, and uh, we didn't routinely get responses to those letters. I think that the Prime Minister, like others, took the view that legal migration didn't matter, and that Brexit, if it was anything, was about taking back control, but not bringing down the numbers. I disagree with that. Mm. I think that Brexit was one of a number of votes by the British public throughout my lifetime, which has been about not just 
taking control of the levers, but using them to bring down the level of net migration to this country and building a different economic model based on investing in our own people and productivity, not just importing foreign labour. That's what we need to do now. That is the future of the Conservative Party. Well, we've put some of those comments to number 10, and here is how they have responded. A government spokesperson said the Prime Minister has been unambiguously clear that the current levels of migration to the UK are far too high. That's why last year we announced the biggest ever package of measures any Prime Minister has delivered to reduce net migration, meaning that 300,000 people who came to the UK legally last year will no longer be able to come. The government is committed to transparency and already publishes huge amounts of immigration data. Case workers can make decisions on criminality when considering immigration applications. We will remove foreign nationals who abuse our hospitality by committing crimes. I mean, John, the standout things there for me were the former Immigration Minister saying that the Prime Minister did not, not once was the quote there, not once wanted to talk to him about legal immigration. Mm. And he is of the view as well that our Prime Minister does not see a problem with massive levels of immigration. Yeah, and what we don't know is obviously, uh, usually a Prime Minister thinks, can we stick to the agenda? You don't, in fact, get your ministers in and having wide ranging discussions because life isn't like that. Immigration minister. I know. But what you then, as in fact Robert Jendrick admits, is they then did go ahead and have a general discussion. Mm. Now, of course, you can consider the whole policy about immigration and this Conservative government. You have to be aware of the fact that the Prime Minister is the first, you know, Minister of Colour, if you want to describe it that way, um, to be Prime Minister. He's very concerned about being seen to play the race card which is not just a moral issue, but is also politically astute. You've got to be very careful not to appear to be taking sides on that. Almost everyone agrees about illegal migration and illegal okay. immigrants, and therefore, for him, that's where he wants to sit most of his policy behind, frankly, because it's easier right. politically. I, I mean, what did you make of that? I think John is taking quite a sympathetic view towards Rishi Sunak there. Fair enough. Uh, how, what do you make of what Robert Jemrick has just said there? Look. Three elections for the Tories, one referendum. In every single one of those elections or referendums, the topic of immigration has been one of the highest priorities for the British people, and they have voted time and time again to get those numbers down, mm. legal and illegal. To, to, for, for Rishi Sunak not to be taking this seriously is an absolute crime as Prime Minister. I mean, it's the reason why the Tory party is crashing in the polls. And, and my, my, my problem with, with Robert Jenrick is when he left office, he never called Rishi Sunak to resign. If he's saying Rishi's not taking me seriously, not taking illegal immigration seriously, why not call for the prime minister to resign and install someone that is going to do that? It's quite obvious to me that, that, that Sunak has no intention of fixing this issue, as we spoke about earlier on in the show, for his obvious next career move. Mm. OK, go on, John. Yeah, I mean, we also have to kind of take a step back and look at the context of where we've got to when it comes to net migration. It's at record highs, but also there's been unique things that have happened. There's been the Ukraine resettlement scheme. There's been, you know, Hong Kong. There's been um, all sorts of things that have happened that have made it this high. That's one thing. But also, I think that Rishi Sunak is smart enough to understand that this isn't just, like, a quick fix, that you mm. just turn the tap off when it comes to net migration. This is legal migration, and even a big chunk of that as well is students and the income that this country gets from students is in billions and then you've got things like he's saying about you know uh, reskilling workers that takes time and then who pays for that is it going to be the companies then prices go up for the rest of us is it going to be the taxpayers it needs a full strategy at the right time and Rishi Sunak understands that whereas he's chasing uh, sound bites well this is chasing sound bites okay I, I do think it is deeply concerning and potentially quite surprising for a lot of people to realise that you have a former immigration minister there saying that he would try to have regular conversations with the Prime Minister about record levels of migration. The Prime Minister didn't appear to have any appetite to that. He also pointed to the idea that there was something psychologically at it. Can I just touch as well on, on really what was another major point of that interview, non-immigration based, which was about the level of crime that we've got, uh, saying that around 52% of crime is committed by about 9% of people. And Robert Jemrick there being very, very clear, he's saying that we need to build more prisons, John. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with all that. I think that, you know, one of the problems the government's had throughout is to sort of, you know, will the end but not the means. Mm. And the idea that you can, in all sorts of areas, that you can just say, we should be doing more of this, we should give more money to this, we should do that. And you do feel there's extraordinary lack of coherence when it comes to are there enough prisons? Of course, are there enough roads? Are there enough yep. hospitals? But over wide areas of public services, we've been failed. And, and Alex, very quickly on this now, um, he said that there was one shocking case of a man who has committed 44 separate offences <laughs> and still not been sent to prison. It's, it's absolutely insane to hear that, isn't it? Really, really shocking. Again, statistics we don't hear very often, so a great interview. I just want to give them what one country in the world that has solved this problem through building a massive prison in El Salvador, which used to be one of the most dangerous countries on the planet is now safer than any Western country in the world because the, the president, Bekele, over there has tackled all the gangs. He has arrested people without uh, with, without worrying about any repercussions mm. as to whether they were, uh, you know, parts of gangs or not. He's gone full force and they have solved their problem. And right. that's what we should do too. Just one last thing. He mentioned as well in the interview about, you know, Western values and stuff, and I agree with that to an extent, but also we've seen the breaking news today of a politician, the DUP leader, who has been... Active case. Yes. But you know what I mean? It yes. kind of puts it in the forefront that we should be very careful when it comes to pigeonholing people from a certain background. Absolutely, yes. Uh, all right, look, <laughs> thank you very much, all of you. It's, uh, it's another good start to uh, the hour. Right, let's... Um, yes, when I come back, we're going to have all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you today. So stay tuned to be bang across tomorrow's news agenda. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us we've see, continued to see the mix of some sunshine but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area low pressure which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere turn and clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
OK, I have all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you right now. Let's do it. We start with the Daily Express. Tory MPs uh, warn voting for Reform UK will kill Brexit. It's a bold move, that. And, uh, OK, we go on to the Independent. Turmoil as union leader resigns over sex offence charges. Northern Ireland is rocked by historical allegations against DUP chief and longest-serving MP Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. That's the front of the Independent. The Times. NHS patients facing long waits to get private care. Uh, they also, of course, have that DUP leader and woman charged over sex offences. The I, marooned by cuts to buses, 16 miles... Sorry, 16 million miles of routes acts. Yes, cash-strapped councils across England have cut more than 90% of their bus services. It is especially a problem for elderly people in rural areas and something that does need to be rectified. The Mirror, Lotto Forger goes free. Two and a half million pound ticket fraudster out of jail after just half of his nine year term. Okay, well, there we go. Uh, right, so those are the first draft of front pages. Uh, I'm going to throw it over now to former BBC and ITV political top dog, John Sargent, <laughs> to discuss what is on the front of quite a few national newspapers tomorrow. And I'll read the Independent first then. Turmoil as unionist leader resigns over sex offence charges. John. Well, of course, the, I mean, the real problem is Sir Geoffrey Donaldson's career now looks as if it's old, his political career, but he's the one that, with a party with lots of difficulty and lots of argument behind the scenes, managed to get power sharing back in Stormont and Stormont going. Local government going in Northern Ireland after two years of delay. So this is a critical point. They're just bedding the system down <coughs> after two months and then this scandal erupts. Now, the man who helped negotiate uh, this deal on the DUP side was is now the new leader. Mm. So that's Gavin Inter Robinson. Yeah, interim leader. So that is a good sign. It means in terms of... When I, when I say a good sign, it means in terms of can they keep up the momentum of this very important political story? Nothing to do with the charges and all the rest of it. Can they do that? Can they get through this period? Can they re-establish, frankly, democracy in Northern Ireland? So that's incredibly important. Mm. And suddenly you get this completely sort of blindside thing going on. Nothing to do with all this, <coughs> but it does have an effect on Northern Ireland. For people like me who covered the Troubles years ago, we sort of hold our breath and think, oh, uh, can they just get through this next bit? Mm. Can they just have a few more months at least of power sharing before being thrown into turmoil again? Because Northern Ireland just needs stability. They need a government. And that's why, as I say, not just people like me, but for everybody in Northern Ireland, that's what people are worried about, and that's what concerns them, and that's what should worry us all. Yeah, indeed. Well, look, uh, well, well expressed, obviously. We will leave that particular case there for now, but just moving on. Uh, London, as we all know, is a very multicultural city, and the UK is becoming increasingly multicultural. If you live in Birmingham, for example, or uh, Greater Manchester, I mean, everywhere, really, isn't it? But I suppose we are technically still a Christian country, aren't we? But now, when you walk through parts of major cities like London, the lights displayed here, they say Happy Ramadan. Now, this is Easter weekend. Shouldn't they say Happy Easter? Should we have both? Is Ramadan now more popular than Easter? Uh, Alex, I'll start with you. I mean, well, what do you make of this? I suppose an argument against all of this would be that those Ramadan lights that we saw there were paid for by a billionaire businessman, and if Christians felt more strongly about their faith, then they could pay to have the lights up, couldn't they? Well, look, I, th I think really the argument should be about respectfulness. You know, it's a very, very... It's the most holy weekend for Christians across the country and, and traditionally has always been. One of the most, should I say. And to have these lights up during that weekend, to me, seems very out of touch. I, I don't blame the man who's funded it because surely he's just trying to do good for his community. It's the, it's the Labour-run Westminster Council who've only had that, that council for two years who are making these decisions. And there should have been someone in that council that said, actually, does this look bad on us? OK, uh, all right. Joanna, what do you think about, about this? Do you think that maybe 
there is may, perhaps more of a focus on other religions as opposed to Christianity. You're shaking your head. No, no, I don't at all. And I think things like this are completely blown out of proportion. If I go to Dubai, there's Christmas trees, you know? And mm. here, even though it's a Christian country, how many of you actually go to church on Christmas Day? Or how many of you are going to be attending church? on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. So I think sometimes we blow these things out of proportion. Like you said, it was privately funded. It's not like it was taxpayers' money from a um, Christian country. And I think it's another thing to be outraged about. When we get to a point where we actually start banning Easter eggs and things like that, or just telling people eggs, that they can't... Actually. Well, just, just, just your eggs, eggs yeah. I mean, well, But yeah. even that makes a mockery. Like, for me, I'm Catholic, and mm. Easter eggs... But do you not, not see the problem don't here? Don't actually it's, represent. But, it's become a gimmicky. But, but do you not thing. see the problem here? It, it's it's a it's a washing of Christian traditions and it, and replacement. And this is what people feel. Sorry, you may you, I, may you may not think that it's a big issue. And I do agree that these things do get over exaggerated. But you do do you not see that the optics of it look wrong? And no. that if this was done during an Islamic period or, or, or a Jewish period, people would also feel that outrage in those. No, communities. I don't think so. Because if it was widespread across the UK and right. it became law, then fine. And if it was replacing. Easter lights, which don't exist. <laughs> then I'd get it. Quickly. I just uh, wish people would remember the, the importance of Easter, which is it's not Christmas, it's not the birth of Christ, it's not total celebration. Uh, Jesus Christ on Friday is crucified, is resurrected, and then people celebrate on Easter Sunday. Mm. I wish there was a slight feeling mm. that this is telling a very dramatic story, which has affected people for nearly 2,000 yep. years, and isn't just, oh, let's have another holiday. Mm. Can I just yeah, yeah. can I just open uh, another can of worms here, which is you mentioned washing the Christian faith. You mentioned a dramatic story. Well, this is a dramatic story about a lack of washing. <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> Ross, Jonathan <laughs> Ross has openly admitted that he only showers once a week. <coughs> Excuse me, it's enough to make you choke, isn't it? <laughs> and he thinks it's a waste of time. <laughs> he confessed oh that he once <laughs> went two weeks without washing in the United States because he'd been oh. in a swimming pool. But then he discovered. He still smelled badly. Ugh. Jonathan Ross doesn't wash, apparently. I find this astonishing. Uh, absolutely astonishing. Uh, Joanna, would we be calling him gross? Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan Gross? <laughs> Jonathan Gross. That's <laughs> so poor. Like that. Not quite that. Go on. I don't want to call him gross, but this <coughs> is gross. And actually, I feel like stories like this always seem to come from celebrities that can afford a water bill. <laughs> yeah. compared to other people. But it reminded me also of um, Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher saying that they don't really believe in bathing their children too much. Then there was another story of some people saying they don't wash their legs in the shower because the, the water just apparently naturally runs down. Weird. Things like this really, really, really gross me out. But also, why would you volunteer this information? Why would you volunteer? I didn't need yeah, to... that's and a his good point. poor wife. Oh, she doesn't. She does it as well, though. She does it as well. It says in the article she does it too. Birds of a feather. Oh, gross. <laughs> also, the other thing is just ask yourself a simple question. Do you want to s imagine Jonathan Ross in a show? I really couldn't think I mean, of anything the worse. The answer is clearly no, I do not. No. Could you please talk I'd about like something to imagine, else? I would like to imagine, though, that he does occasionally shower. It's one thing imagining him, but now I, now I know that he barely yeah, does. Yeah, once a fortnight. Once oh, a fortnight. Oh, <laughs> he's, fairly, he's fairly rebarbative without <laughs> thinking about him not showering. Right. That's a great word. Okay, <laughs> now look, time for something completely different, as they say. A lady tried to test how deep a river was. Always a mistake, mm -hmm. okay? And accidentally got more than she bargained for. Let's have a little look. <laughs> oh, no! Why did her mate go in? Yeah. The blind leading the blind, isn't Good, it? Honestly, do you've seen what's happened to Tracy? Right, why has that happened now to you? Anyway, I hope it wasn't full of E. coli or anything like that. <laughs> uh, right, coming up, our panel nominates their greatest Britons and Union Jackasses Plus. Um, oh, we've got breaking news. Oh, what, oh, gosh, I wonder what's wrong with that. <laughs> David Lammy has just dropped a, a massive clangor. Yes, plus a cemetery has cancelled their Easter egg hunt after being branded inappropriate. But why, apart from the fact that it's in a cemetery? I'll tell you in a sec. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can...
can do amazing things for this country and for the world. And I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. But why not spend... 100 million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex? Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe... A I mean, well, if we look <laughs> over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for, because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and as Albie actually pointed out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million is not enough. 100, it's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, the, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a... it's work nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue signaler, well, is it charity not? charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's a, a very Christian of them. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. I have got the rest of tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you. Let's do it. Right, we start with the Daily Telegraph. Plan for league table of migrant crime. Well, yeah, we got this scoop as well. Robert Jemrick here. Senior Tories demand detailed analysis to toughen visa and deportation policies. We're speaking a lot about this. Do we have a right to know where people are coming from and what crimes they are committing here in Britain? Let's go to the Daily Mail. Labour more trusted on defence than the Tories. Wow, that is a headline that will be... Uh, raising a few eyebrows in number 10, a poll reveals that voters now associate Conservatives with cutting military spending, mm. not increasing it. Wow. Let's go to The Guardian. Schools risk fueling hate by avoiding talking about the Gaza war. That's what they say there. And let's finish with The Daily Star. Why not? At last, our soldiers are allowed to grow beards, but only, quotes proper ones. And there's uh, Dad's army uh, one there, Dad's hairy army. Oh, we've got the sun as well. Good. Easter chocolate crisis. Brits face shortage as prices soar. Bake Off threat to Axe TV special. They call it Chocky Horror. There we go. Right, OK, so those are all of your front pages. I think the um, most fascinating one there is that the public now do, apparently, anyway, uh, see the Tories as the party of military cuts and Labour has been more trusted on defence. I mean, that is really a massive shift. Let's be perfectly honest with you if that is actually the case and, you know, something that the Tories would maybe need to address. Um, but would you take your child to an Easter egg hunt in a cemetery? Well, Wrexham Cemetery thought it would be a great idea, yet they had to cancel it after receiving quite a lot of backlash. People said it felt inappropriate as they had relatives buried there. Did you think this was a good or a bad idea? Remarkable stuff. I mean, you know, these people are quite harebrained, aren't they? I don't know about when the last time any of you went on Easter egg hunt, but I dare say you probably wouldn't have done yeah. it in a cemetery. Yeah. I, I, I will say, though, look, if, if you read the article through and through, the, the reason why they were doing it is because they wanted young people to engage in the preservation of cemeteries, and they are usually very beautiful places, cemeteries. I don't know whether I feel it was a little bit out of touch to maybe do an Easter egg hunt. Would you say it was a grave error of judgment? <laughs> <laughs> I would be so brave, Patrick. Thank you. Um, no, but, yeah. but, look, I mean, like, I, I do think that, that uh, young people getting involved in the upkeep of those areas is not a bad thing, but maybe young children's a little oh. bit out of touch. Fine. Now, look, hey, it appears that social media are criticising what they say are Ofcom's double standards. I, of course, would never do anything like that. Now, it followed this incident from the Shadow Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs, a Mr David Lammy. Take it away, Mr Lammy. Um... Oh, we've got breaking news that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has resigned as leader of the DUP. Hang on a minute. Can I just ask us... I don't know if we can do this, guys. Could we just play that again? Could anyone just see maybe what, what is... 
what we think might be wrong here. Go on, David. Um, oh, we've got breaking news that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has resigned as leader of the DUP. We've got breaking news for you, OK? David Lammy is a serving politician and should not be breaking any news on his own show on radio. So there we go. Just thought I'd uh, address that. Anyway, uh, it is time to bring you today's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. All right. OK, Joanna, I'll start with you. Who's your Greatest Britain, please? Mine is a guy called Dan Daffid, uh, a Scotland shopkeeper, who actually ordered too many Easter eggs and ended up raising £3,000 um, for charity. Uh, Good for that, him. So... Good for him. Best okay. Out, bad situation. Look, that's a very, very nice start. Okay, yeah. go on. Well, look, Patrick, it's Good Friday. It's an Easter weekend. We're complaining about this not being Christian enough. So, of course, my honorary greatest Britain is, of course, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's going to be it. hard to beat, John. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Jake, let's keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's try and be normal about this. <laughs> <laughs> How offensive. Yeah, no, it is. Jesus Christ, superstar, I know. But look, <laughs> no, it's the king, of course, isn't it? No, uh, uh, okay. coming out of his obviously very difficult period for him, but he's going to attend the service, Easter service, on Sunday at Windsor. And as far as I'm concerned, that just shows he's a great king. Oh, lovely. OK, all right. Well, uh, today's honorary greatest Britain is Jesus Christ. So there we go. He is the king of kings. I, I'll, be honest, be... I'll be honest with you. I, I want someone who presents Jesus Christ. I can't really say no. Um, OK, so uh, let's round it off, Joanna, with your union jackass, please. My union jackass are actually the shareholders of Thameswater, who backed out of giving £500 million of funding to improve infrastructure, yet they take ridiculous amounts of dividends um, and also expect the rest of us to pay yeah. more to fix It'll be a popular choice. That. It'll be a very popular choice with our viewers, actually, Joanna, mm. I must say. Um, go on, Alex. My, mine are the Tory party advisers who are fleeing the opposite way to Keir Starmer, but had I heard your breaking news just then, Patrick, I probably would have picked David Lammy. You would have picked that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Be very careful with those words there, no, but, uh, yeah. Uh, go on, um, go on. Who's your, uh, who's your union jackass? Paula Vanos. I mean, she's the former head of the post office. She's not saying anything. She was there at the height of the scandal. We've got all kinds of problems emerging every day and evidence, mm. and the lawyers are saying it'd be inappropriate for her and the other former leaders to discuss things while the inquiry is going on. Well, that is just absurd. She should say something, even if she says, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Even if she says, I worry about all these things, I'll be giving the okay. full details when, I, when the inquiry is oh. over. But to say absolutely nothing is outrageous. So, look, I tossed a coin on those two before and I landed on Paula Van Nulls as today's mm. Union Jackass. So, thank you very much. Wonderful show. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Have a very happy Easter, everybody. I'll see you on Monday at 9. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us, we've see, continued to see the mix of some sunshine, but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area, low pressure, which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere, turning clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Britain's newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Shocking new study says that vaping might be linked to cancer. Not that shocking. It found e-cigarettes can cause similar DNA changes to cells of smoking, leading experts to claim that vaping does not seem as harmless as originally billed. So joining us now is Robert Sidebottom from the UK Vaping Industry Association. Good morning, Robert. Um, is this terrible news for your industry? I imagine you're going to try and defend uh, the products still and say that there's still a lot more research to be done. Well, I don't need to really defend the product because I think actually if you read the article and you read the detail in the article, I mean, it actually starts and it states with, while this does 